Thanks for the introduction. Amazing. Um, okay, let's start. We will talk about the future, and this is important. Uh, it's important. Yeah, because you know why? Why is it so fascinating? Have you thought about that? I think there's one simple answer to that. You and I, uh, everybody you know, actually everybody, will spend the rest of our lives in the future. Okay? And there is a chance that we can design that to something we really want. And to do that, we need to understand what are the mechanics? How does the future work? And this is what we do in our labs. If you hear music in your head right now, it's, it's not just an early morning thing. It's a, it's a mimicry of the Beatles. And AI mimicked everything they ever done and started writing songs. They have 1,700,000 followers on YouTube. That's pretty good, no? And if you think about it, it should give us very profound and deep questions about how the world works. What is human work, right? Deep, profound questions. And the big question is obviously, what's the future? That's the first mechanics of change, your imagination. Number one. The second is the exponential change. You know about it. Every time you look, the change is faster. And that leads to the third mechanics of change, which is convergence. Absolutely unexpected. And let me show you an example. I want to be a scientist. Eureka! A scientist. I think science is so amazing. Why do you want to be a scientist? Uh, I always really liked chemistry and physics in school. The study of physics is incredible. Take gravity. You can't see it, but the second you trip, it's right there to pull you down. Right. Did you ever fall or trip on something? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, all the time. It happens to me all the time. That's gravity pulling you down, sometimes with an ouch. Yeah, sometimes with an ouch. What's happening here? What did someone just imagine with these exponential powers that converged to that? Well, it's simply Moore's law. Coming together with computational power we couldn't imagine 10 years ago for 120 euro. I know because I bought one. It's Wi-Fi, we take for granted. It's cloud computing. It's natural language processing, which is part of machine learning. The convergence in exponential speed and our imagination. Now, what do we do with it? Here's an example, right in front of our noses. These guys are going to space, you know it, in private vehicles. This dude, I met him two years ago, he's uh, building a machine. He worked for NASA for 17 years, quit, because that's boring, I guess, and started to make that thing, shoot it up in space, capture asteroids, and make rocket fuel. He's saying he's building gas stations in space. And the reason is very simple. He thinks we will have lives, 7-Elevens and vacation and work in space. He's just building that to facilitate for a future that we just articulated, the industrialization of space. And that's not the future, it's happening right now. There's many more evidence to that. Next example, it takes just an awful lot of time to make a decent doctor. But even if we do, every illness and condition you ever had, all the conditions in the world, all the conditions in Homo sapiens history, available at any time related to the latest research, to the condition you are in right now. Can she do that? No, but an AI can. And this is amazing because doctors and AI can work together and actually statistically have even better results. So this is what we do. We look at the future, we look at the mechanics, we build these narratives. Here's 30 seconds and 30 years of possible futures, as we call them. From these, we choose the desirable ones. And from these, we choose the ones when we can play an absolutely impactful and positive role in. And that's sort of the first, first chapter, understanding the future and imagining these narratives. And that's your job. You're accountable for it. Otherwise, someone will hand you the future, and you might not like it. So don't complain, get working. And just remember, never in the human history has the now been so temporary. So what do we do now when we look ahead? What to learn to understand the future? What are the new values of work? Look at these ladies. Try to tell them something clever, why they should be relevant 10 years from now, or 20. Yeah? And be honest, you have no idea. 
And that's a good thing, because this is how science works. The scientific ignorance. Let's find out. What are the new values and attitudes? And there are many examples how that these things work. And even the World Economic Forum says that we will be creative. We will thrive on critical thinking, not just complacency. Creativity, emotional flexibility, and cognitive flexibility and emotional intelligence. These things are coming together and becoming the human work when the rest is automated. Basically, you know, today you get a good salary and a nice bonus when you repeat your results. What's your results, Martin? Can you repeat it next quarter? You know, that by definition is stagnation. If you repeat something over and over again, that's the diagonal opposite of innovation. We are moving to curious purpose seeking, in experimentation, in mutual empowerment, in transparent networks. That's the definition of future of work in a nutshell. Okay, we understand the values, we understand how the future works, we can imagine scenarios. How do we apply it in, for example, business, right? There's horizons of innovation. You know this one, uh, because you're really good at it and you love it. Uh, that's a human bias, by the way. We like things we love, <laughs> and we do it all the time. But the timeline is changing. There's a next horizon. When you know what you're doing, you can forecast it to the future. You can use your resources, your imagination. What will happen next? But fortunately, and again, the timeline is changing, there's this horizon, the third. And if you can forecast to that one, it's not the third horizon. <laughs> because that one builds on things you don't know. Things you only can imagine, and you have no idea how to go there. Uh, you know, John F. Kennedy, moonshot, yeah? Exactly that. So the only thing you can do is backcast. You imagine where you want to be and what you do each year before that. And when they, th these arrows meet, you have the horizon of trust. You trust your vision, and you trust your current resources. It's very important. Now, we have done that. We understand the future a little bit. We have our methods that we deeply, deeply explore. And then we ask this question. What is really human? And what is work in a superhuman future? Especially when robots can do that. You've seen it. It's funny every time. Amazing. Yeah, slow motion, too. OK, last chapter. So we, we have an innovation vision, a vision of, of this work, and I think it's an important one. I love it. These solutions that we have imagined will be the most empathic symbiosis between machine intelligence and human ingenuity. And these are two sides of the story, and they have sort of four dimensions. First, things will be self-running around us. They will be also self-organizing. We will become superhuman, and we think it's a new intelligence of work. Human intelligence and machine intelligence coming together. OK, let's look at the first, self-running. What does it mean? Self-running cars, we know, they have all sorts of functions. Look at the humans. They focus on interactions and explorations. They are served data, information, and knowledge. So now they can have an opinion, an educated one. This is high-value human tasks. And that's what's happening, moving from the we want to reach to the high value and move the low value tasks into automation. We've been doing this since the 50s. Now we're reaching a new kind of intelligence here, assisted by the machines, so we can be even higher in our cognitive load. And in the end, maybe explore and exchange subjective opinions. It's a little bit like Maslow's pyramid of needs. So we're moving from this low level cognitive load and manual load to our passions and very deep questions. Second dimension of change in, in this innovation vision that we see here, the things will self-organize. Um, moving a little bit from this currency, this power of stockpiling your assets and potatoes and oil, to maybe distributing it, and your power comes from the relevance in whatever ecosystem you play in. I don't have time to give you any examples, but obviously this runs on a technology of, of different kinds of blockchain. Um, these two are the machine intelligence, the self-running and self-organizing. Okay, the superhuman, my favorite. Um, there she is. Human ingenuity side. Focus on what we're best at, actually, now when we actually can be human at last. 
Let me give you an example. Um, here's my assistant. Hey, co-pilot, what's up this morning? Good morning, Martin. You will have a fairly busy morning, but there is time for a good cup of coffee. Your biometrics show me that it would be good for you. Okay. But just one cup, remember. Okay, I will remember. I obviously drink too much coffee in the morning, and I'm useless because it will be busy. So this thing knows me pretty well. Hey, me and Leia have discussed how, uh, you know, team satisfaction and how they work and their productivity. How does it hang together with, with the budgets we have? When colleagues travel so they can spend time face to face, your delivery quality goes up 5%. That saves software maintenance costs with customers by 2.5%. I found the routes that would make sense economically and that allow the colleagues to spend the most time face to face. We will review them tomorrow. That's not bad. Uh, okay, I have a business trip tomorrow. Uh, is everything set up and, and okay? Yes. Oh, here is a surprise. If you switch from window to an aisle seat on tomorrow's flight, you will most likely be more successful in your budget negotiation, <laughs> according to your travel and performance data. Okay. Want to change? Hell yeah, I want to change. If I switch seats and get more cash, yes, I want to do that. So what we have here, AI finds patterns and causalities beyond our bias. That is enormous burden and our mental capabilities. So what we're doing is that we're moving out of the cage, the prison of human knowledge. We are becoming superhuman. And we can debate what is the smartest app, app out there, but I have a simple answer. That's the one that makes you smarter. And the mechanics, which I can just deep dive for hours, which we won't do because I am almost out of time, are like this. We're moving from content to context. From data becomes information, knowledge, and then wisdom. And if you have features in your products, you need to make products, but you need to serve them and build a relationships with the people out there. And the activities there, if you're still in the, you know, collecting and managing features, <laughs> you're below the line. You need to nurture relationships. Design relationships, the rest will follow. Okay, that was the superhuman. Human at last, we are able to be humans fully. Let's move to our purpose, because these three things come out of that. I can give you examples, but it comes down to only one question. Why are you relevant 10 years from now? Don't take it personally. Or actually, maybe you should. But at least think about it for your organization. Describe it well. Articulated so you can have a decent, intelligent discussion about it. Because here's the thing if you cannot, right now, describe why you're relevant, your organization or your neighborhood, your company, you, 10 years from now, if you can't, you risk of not being relevant 10 years from now in this ecosystem of empowerment. And that's not good. So you do it, design your future. We think this is a new kind of intelligence. We're making software for it. We think, or I think, it's comparable to music. You know, when everything is running in harmony, humans are excellent to screw things up pretty badly. And that gives us new challenges, because we do make art we don't even understand. That's tension. So don't be afraid of machines, because they will just do one thing. We will always ask new questions. And I think that gives us a new definition of work. We are merging the human ingenuity and the complex decisions. And complex decisions require creativity. And your creativity is not adjusting you know, margins in your Word document. No. But writing a love letter, that is. So this is what I think work is about. Surface, foster, and optimize are individual gifts. Gifts is what your HR department usually uh, calls skill sets. Yeah? But gifts are better because you can give them to an idea. To create a higher value in feelings, wisdom, self-actualization for yourself, but also the communities around you. And I love this quote from Richard Branson. There is a reason why we called human beings and not human doings. So um, make the to-do list. That's important. That's your job. But make also a to-be list. Maybe that's even more important. Now, this is obviously not Verdi. It's an AI. Beautiful, no? Okay, 
The stuff of science fiction is becoming science fact. In between, there's you. You're accountable for the science and the hard damn work to make the science fiction happen in the right direction. We are optimistic and ambitious and very aware of this, or we should be. And once we express and articulate something, like Kennedy, we're going to the moon. There's no stopping us, it's in your head. So I was thinking, let's express that and let's actually design futures we do want to live in. And since we need tension to this harmony, I will just read a poem and I have no idea why. Here it is, and I don't know who, who made it. You're a ghost driving a meat-coated skeleton made of stardust, riding a rock, hurtling through space. Fear nothing. Thank you. <laughs>